Hey everyone, it's Colin. How's it going? The mid-90s were the peak of the beige PC era, except this machine isn't quite what one would expect. I picked up a Powerbase 180 made by Power Computing. It dates back to August of 1996, though this particular unit seems to have gone through some upgrades in the years since. It's missing its optical drive, and around back, one of the PCI slot covers is gone, though a two-port USB card had been added. I pulled the cover and found that someone had indeed been tinkering around in here. There were a few loose ribbon cables inside, IDE and SCSI, along with an optical drive audio cable. The Powerbase system shipped with a SCSI CD-ROM drive, but a previous owner seems to have swapped it with an IDE model later on, likely a CD burner. The hard drive was upgraded too, from the original 1.2GB unit to this 30GB model from Maxdoor. Given its printed warranty expiration of November 2003, it likely got installed sometime in the year 2000. Interestingly, the built-in video circuitry resides on the three-slot PCI riser card and features an ATI RAGE 2 chipset with 2 megabytes of video RAM. By the turn of the millennium, that would have proven pretty anemic, so the missing slot cover was likely where an upgraded video card had been installed. On the other side of the riser is the CPU card, which is held secure with a couple of plastic clips, even though it fits tightly into its edge connector. This one has a 180MHz PowerPC 603E CPU, and that largely gives away what makes this machine special. It's not a PC. It's a Mac. A Mac clone, to be specific. In an attempt to increase its market share, Apple licensed out the Mac operating system in the mid-90s, and Power Computing was one of the first of the so-called clone manufacturers. It was based in Texas and final assembly was done in the U.S. to allow better flexibility and shorten shipping times to customers. Power Computing's cases looked a lot more like a typical Windows computer than a Mac, though, as a way to cut costs. The back panel offered a curious selection of ports. Audio in and out were on the right, along with ADB for keyboard and mouse. But next to the two serial ports were a pair of PS2 connections. Apple never put these on its own computers, but they did indeed work. And that flexibility extended to the video output options, with a Mac 15-pin connector and a typical VGA port so you could either reuse an existing Mac monitor or easily connect a less expensive, generic one. My goal with this machine was to set it up similar to how it shipped. I decided to leave the RAM and hard drive upgrades in place, but things like the USB card needed to go, as it wouldn't get support until later versions of the Mac OS. Under the floppy drive was an interesting note. The system's clock, or PRAM, battery had been replaced in 2001 at a cost of just under 10 bucks. 20 years later, it likely needed replacing again. I also wanted to take a close look at the motherboard in case any of its surface mount capacitors needed to be replaced, so I pulled out the top bracket and the PCI riser card. The ribbon cables came out next, and that got me a good look at the motherboard. Surprisingly, it didn't seem to need any work. There were no signs of capacitor leakage, and aside from the typical dust, the board was very clean. I decided to save replacing them for another day. I had an internal IDE zip drive with matching mounting kit that I wanted to add to the lower five and a quarter bay. But even though those drives were common at the time, I don't think that was ever an option for this one. The hard drive was already installed in that bay, and there was no room to move it to the floppy drive bracket. I did spot this area on top of the power supply that looked suspiciously like a hard drive could go there, but there was no way to secure it. And looking at the original IDE cable that was left in the computer, 
Its length and shape suggested that the drive came in that lower bay from the factory. So much for adding the zip. Next up was replacing the missing optical drive. I got the SCSI ribbon reinstalled and picked up a new old stock Sony CD-ROM. It's model CDU55S, which predates the power base by a couple of years. It was a 2.4 times drive, while CD-ROMs in 1996, when this computer shipped, were more commonly around eight times. I got the jumpers set to use SCSI ID3 and slid the drive into the top bay. I connected the power and data cables, screwed the drive into place, then remembered to hook up the audio cable. I found a few PCI slot covers for the back. They weren't the same as the remaining original ones, so I swapped them all so at least they'd match. This machine was overall pretty easy to work inside, despite its somewhat cramped quarters. When I got the unit put back together, I powered it on, but it only kinda worked. The computer was on, but it never displayed any video and didn't sound like it was booting. This turned out to be an easy fix. I found a reference online that the motherboards in these wouldn't boot with a dead PRAM battery. And this one was very dead. New 3.6 volt batteries are still being made, so I picked up a few and dropped one in. After that, it fired right up. The hard drive already had macOS 9 installed on it, but the system would freeze when booting. I suspected that it was a software problem, yet I couldn't get it to boot from the new internal CD-ROM drive either. It would never detect the disk. I ended up connecting an external SCSI CD-ROM drive, which worked. Turns out the problem was that the new Sony drive wasn't being picked up on the SCSI bus at all. The external drive was the only thing listed. I confirmed the jumper settings and even tried a brand new internal SCSI ribbon cable, but no luck. My best guess is that the problem was due to the drive's lack of a jumper option for SCSI bus termination. Ultimately, I gave up on the drive, which was probably for the best, as it didn't quite match the color of the front bezel anyway. I found a different one from NEC. It wasn't in perfect cosmetic condition, but it had clearly marked jumper settings, including one for SCSI termination. I got it set up appropriately and installed into the case. Its bezel was a much closer match, too. Thankfully, someone had archived the original restore disk for the Powerbase series online, so I burned a copy. Holding down Shift-Command-Option-Delete while powering the machine on signaled it to boot from the SCSI bus instead of the hard drive, and the new drive seemed to be working. With Apple-branded Macs, one generally didn't need to worry about drivers, but with the clones, this was more of a concern. Apple had the tendency to install custom firmware on the drives in its systems, and the default disk formatting utility would only work with them. To format a generic drive, you'd need to use a third-party utility, like FWB Hard Disk Toolkit, which was included on the restore disk. But that limitation only applied to SCSI hard drives, not IDE ones like this Powerbase had. Apple switched to IDE drives itself in the mid-90s, and thankfully relaxed that firmware limitation. So its drive setup program would work on any disk. I was able to reformat the drive without any issues and installed System 753. Drive limitations were unfortunately still a thing for optical drives, though. While Macs could boot from a CD using a non-Apple drive, once started up off the hard drive, they'd no longer be recognized. Power computing also included a third-party CD-ROM driver, FWB's CD-ROM toolkit, and I got it installed. It detected the drive, and after a reboot, it should have been enough to get the drive working. Except it wasn't. The disk wasn't being read, and when I reopened the CD-ROM toolkit utility, I found something curious. It listed the NEC drive as no driver. I tried checking the box to enable it, but an error message said that the drive wasn't supported. And here's why. The About box showed this version of Toolkit was 2.2.1 from 1996. But the drive I installed was model CD3010A, a 40x drive made in 2000. 
I connected an external SCSI zip drive and dropped in a disk I knew had some useful utilities on it. One of them was a newer version of CD-ROM Toolkit, which I got copied over. But after a reboot, it still didn't want to work with the drive. I had two other choices. One was a freeware driver called CD Sunrise, which was known to be compatible with a wide variety of CD-ROM drives. The downside is that it only had basic functionality of reading Mac formatted disks, and not things like audio CDs or cross-platform media. So instead, I went with a specific version of Apple's CD-ROM driver that originally shipped with macOS 7.6. It's version 5.3.1, and it's known to retro Mac enthusiasts as being incredibly useful, but also odd. Unlike other versions of Apple's CD-ROM driver, it doesn't enforce the drive firmware check. Why Apple produced a one-off universal CD-ROM driver is a mystery. It could have been a mistake during development, or perhaps the actions of a rogue engineer. Another plausible theory is that it was intentional as a way to make things easier for the Mac clone manufacturers. The downside to using it is, since it's an original Apple extension, it's susceptible to getting replaced during system software upgrades, so one needs to be cognizant of keeping a backup copy handy. Otherwise, the optical drive stops working again. Finally, I tested out the floppy drive and found... Oh, I'm not good. Give me back. Yeah, it had some problems. I had hoped that all it needed was some cleaning, so I took it apart to have a look. And sure enough, when I popped its top cover, I found a lot of dust inside. I pulled the bottom cover off and vacuumed the drive out, then cleaned and reapplied the grease on the head carriage screw. And while that cured the horrible grinding sound, it didn't fix the drive. Now it was having trouble reading disks, thinking that they were always blank. I had cleaned the heads, but this drive apparently needed much more work, so I did the next best thing and swapped it for another one. It took a bit of fiddling to get it aligned in its mounting bracket properly, as its screw holes were in different positions, but in the end, the new drive worked just fine. Overall, I'm pretty impressed with this machine. It's decently fast, not just because of its 180 megahertz CPU, but also because it had been upgraded to 72 megabytes of RAM. That's an odd number due to a design quirk of the motherboard. It has three RAM slots and supports a maximum of 160 megabytes, but the first slot will only recognize up to a 32 megabyte module. Regardless, 72 megs is still a healthy amount considering the machine only shipped with 16. The PowerBase series was upgradable in other ways too. That modular CPU card came in 200 and 240 megahertz versions as well. And over time, third-party manufacturers like XLR8 and PowerLogix came out with their own CPU upgrades featuring PowerPC G3 and G4 chips. Third-party upgrades for a third-party Mac. Its PCI card slot situation was a bit peculiar. While the PowerBase series was available in both desktop and mini tower form factors, the same motherboard was used in both as a cost saving measure. This meant that the mini tower also had the same PCI riser card as the desktop, and thus any cards would actually be upside down and not perpendicular to the board like in most PCs. While they weren't as sleek as Apple's computers at the time, Power Computing's lineup, like many of the other clone makers, was a very compelling value. They were as fast, if not faster, than proper Macs, and were far less expensive. The PowerBase series in particular garnered rave reviews, and sales were brisk, selling out at times. Power Computing had a major hit. And that was actually its undoing. Apple's clone program backfired. Instead of increasing the Mac's market share, the clone makers ate into Apple's own sales. The company was losing money fast, and one of the first things Steve Jobs did when he returned in 1997 was to cancel all of the licensing agreements, effectively killing off Mac clones. Except it wasn't quite so easy with power computing. 
Due to the way their contract had been negotiated, it couldn't just be terminated at Apple's will. Cash-strapped Apple ended up having to buy out power computing at a cost of $100 million worth of stock. These days, Mac clones are somewhat rare. This is likely because of their typically mundane appearance. While many were sold in their heyday with nothing to distinguish them, over time, most were probably assumed to be ordinary PCs and recycled. They definitely lacked the style, fit, or finish of Apple's Macs. But to those who bought them, they proved to be just as capable. And as they say, it's what's inside that counts. If you liked the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at ThisDoesNotComp. And as always, thanks for watching.